Welcome to our 23rd Salon of the Maternal Gift Economy Breaking Through series hosted by Genevieve Vaughn, who is with us today and the International Feminist for the Gift Economy. I'm Letitia Lason, your moderator. Our guests, Jennifer Long and Rosa Lydia Dodon Game, are here with us from the USA, and Cecilia Cavallo from Italy, who's currently uh, doing some work in Berlin. Both of these three, uh, actually these three women will speak and be followed by a question and answer. Our first speaker is Cecilia Cavallo. She was born in Calabria, a primary school teacher in Italy, currently in Berlin on a six year foreign service mandate of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. With over 10 years of activism in different associations, aiming at equality and recognition of uni universal rights. She's going to be focusing on her experiences that she's had as an activist and the moral urge we all feel in front of us with so much suffering and oppression. So she's gonna give us a report of the role of Europe and the single member state Italy in the issue of Libya, dividing between what people and NGOs on the one hand and governments on the other hand are doing. So please welcome Cecilia. Hi, Leticia. Hi, Genevieve. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. It's quite a, a special occasion for me and I will tell you later why. Um, and I'll try, as you said, to give uh, an overview of what is happening in the central Mediterranean. And I, I'd like to start uh, with the definition, with the words that we use. Uh, since 2010, we are familiar with the definition of Europe's migrant crisis. And meaning uh, thousands of people asylum seekers, refugees, migrants from countries from the Middle East and from Sub-Saharan Africa, pushing towards the uh, European territory on the wake of wars and of, of poverty. But migration has always been, uh, has always been a, a natural phenomenon. <laughs> Men and women move. And uh, we cannot define migration at any time a crisis which we can define as a crisis is the Western world crisis, the Western world managing the phenomenon. Um, the Western world uh, whose structures, political and economic structures cannot be compatible with the, the values that it claims as fundamental, which is human dignity. And as I said, and I, I, I'll tell you why this is a very special occasion for me, because um, you, told, you said that I was born in, the, in Calabria. The Calabria is the deepest uh, south of Italy. And um, in, in the last century, in, uh, in, in uh, 1908, it was defined as a pendant of debris on the sea meaning how desperate and how poor my region is. But my region is also the region which welcomed thousands of migrants with whom it shared, we shared our own poverty. And so I've been, I've been uh, um, active on a local level for many years. But now, for the first time, and that's why this is a special occasion for me, I can put the issue on the, at the right level, which is the global level. And with global, I, I mean that there are some focal point, points scattered all around the globe where this uh, fake narration of a 
a civilized Western world just falls in pieces before our own eyes. And these places are our borders. I will talk to you about my border. My border is a 300 kilometer long stripe made of water and despair. And it's the border of Fortress Europe. Um, 300 kilometers, which have killed over 40,000 people since 1993. And the question is, how can Europe come to terms with this evidence? I'm uh, going to show you um, my slides, my, my, my screen yet now, because I want, I would like to invite you I don't know if you can see it. Um, I would like to invite you to a sad, sad journey through Europe's bad conscience. The Med has always been, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean has always been a favorite route for migrants to reach Europe because of this narrow stripe um, of water which divides the coasts, coasts of Northern Africa from Italy. Um, but in 2013, something horrible happened. Uh, we can call 2013 the Annus Horribilis of migration. And I, um, I brought this, uh, this, uh, this picture, which I'm, I'm going to show you enlarged. Okay. Uh, this, this is a sculpture, and it is called The Raft of Lampedusa. That's where our journey starts. Our journey doesn't start on the mainland. It doesn't start from the sea. It starts underwater. Uh, this uh, sculpture is part of the Atlantic Underwater Museum uh, in Lanzarote, Spain. And it represents 13 uh, human beings, 13 migrants, men, children, and women, uh, some of them looking towards a possible salvation. Um, a vessel in the horizon, which will never come and will never rescue them. The sculpture refers to this uh, tragedy, which occurred on October the 3rd, 2013, and which uh, is known as the slaughter of innocents. Um, I read from the Chronicles. Less than a quarter mile from the island of the rabbits, a Libyan fishing boat full of migrants began to have engine trouble, causing the ship to begin sinking. In an attempt to contact nearby boats, a blanket on the ship was set on fire. The fire spread in the boat and began to engulf it before it sank. To avoid the flames, many people threw themselves into the water or moved away from the fire to the same part of the ship, which then capsized. More than 360 be human beings died, among them 60 children. And I uh, shared all the material on, on this Padlet. I'm going to give you the link because there is full of material which, which you can um, later watch and comment if, uh, if you want. Um, but I, I'm going to show you just um, one or two minutes from this uh, docufilm about that tragedy. And, um, this is to show how distant the common people uh, are from their institutional representation, re representatives. Um, I hope you will hear it. Uh, we have English subtitles here. Let's see if it works. Abbiamo recuperato quello che c'era in mare perché erano distanti uno dall'altro. L'abbiamo recuperato e la gente pure legando le cime nel corpo per tirarle su perché erano stremate, non ce la facevano. Legarla eh, con una cima, io ero fuori barca, con la scaletta imbragata qui dai, dai fianchi e, e l'abbiamo tirata su. I morti l'avevano i ragazzi, non li lasciavano, loro stessi. L'avevano tenuti per le magliette, capito? C'era parecchi ragazzi nudi, la maggior parte tutte nudi erano, senza vestiti.
Vede la cassa lì? Passa dalla cassa dentro il busto e tira da su da qui con le mani. Una di qua l'abbiamo tirata e una della poppa lì. E una mi sono messo fuori io per imbracarla, se no era con la testa già giù che faceva alza e bassa. Già era arrivata. Poi l'abbiamo portata da su, si era animata un pochettino e così si è salvata pure lei. Mi sono messo pure a piangere vedendo la gente così. Tutta morta di freddo, stremata, stanca. No, no, non avevo la forza di prendere un, un salvagente perché noi ci abbiamo buttato pure il salvagente. Non avevo la forza, erano stremate proprio, morte. E un po' sotto, con le cime l'abbiamo tirata su, un po' con salvagente, quello. Quello che abbiamo potuto fare noi l'abbiamo fatto. Questa barca, dai racconti dei de sopravvissuti, è arrivata sotto costa verso le 3. Alle 4 del mattino loro hanno cominciato a chiedere aiuto ma non riuscivano, non avevano campo, quindi hanno acceso dei fuochi per farsi vedere perché ben tre motopescherecci erano passati e non, non li avevano visti o, o avevano fatto finta di non vedere. Vorrei ricordare che le nostre che le leggi che abbiamo costruito in questi anni hanno fatto sì che sotto inchiesta siano andati anche armatori e pescatori che hanno salvato la vita di queste persone per favoreggiamento. Cioè, noi abbiamo costruito un sistema normativo disumano che ha prodotto questo. Um, as you can see in the video, people were rescued uh, by fishermen. And the lady who is talking in the video uh, is the, uh, sorry, is the, um, the mayor of this little island, which is called Lampedusa. Um, Lampedusa is this little island here, this red point, just near Malta, and it belongs uh, to Sicily. And it is, um, let's say, the door to Europe for many migrants. Um, the video uh, shows how distant human beings are, common people are from the political institution that represent them. And it clearly highlights a social demand for human justice, which we will see in, the, in this presentation, uh, unfortunately still remains unattended. A lot of protests took place in the streets uh, in Italy at that time calling the politicians assassins. And I, I, I'd like to show you how Italy and Europe reacted. Um, the former president of the Italian Republic, Napolitano, uh, spoke about a succession of true slaughters of innocence. And the head of the Council of Europe's Parliamentary Assembly um, made a fervent appeal for specific urgent actions by member states to end this shame. This was in 2013. Um, following uh, the general indignation and the protests, Italy really did something. It launched uh, an action which was called Mare Nostrum. Mare Nostrum was an action uh, operating in the, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean uh, between October 2013 and October 2014. And its main aim was saving lives at sea. It costed 9,5 million dollars, uh, euros uh, per month, and it saved 160,000 migrants in the very first months of activity, the, the first four months of activity. Um, this is what happened at the end of uh, October 2014. At that time, the Italian politicians claimed that the, the migration issue should be tackled by Europe, as the, the migrants heading towards Italy didn't mean to stay in Italy, they just was, they were trying to reach Europe. So Mare Nostrum was uh, dismantled and the European Union took up the uh, initiative with the Triton initiative and setting up a border agency, which is called Frontex. The uh, main aim of this action is not saving lives at sea, 
but it is patrolling the borders of Europe. It costed 2.9 million euros per month. And as we can see in this picture, if we, this is uh, an institutional uh, site, citing how many lives have been saved in the Mediterranean uh, between 2015 and 2021. And if you count them all, you'll see, here's the number, 5,500 people rescued in six years. Well, Italy saved 160,000 lives in four months. This is a shame on Italy and on Europe. But unfortunately, um, the, uh, the um, European hypocrisy would reach its peak only in 2017. Let's start from the statistics and then you'll see that 2017 is just a turning point in, the, uh, in uh, by migration policies. Here is the uh, graph of number of recorded deaths of migrants in the Mediterranean Sea from 2014 to 2021. And you'll see that in 2017, the curve start decreasing and it goes down and down. The same applies to the arrivals in Italy between 2014 and 2021. This is 2017 and look at what uh, collapse we have in numbers of uh, migrants trying to reach Italian coasts. So uh, shall we really um, think that migrant, migrants stopped trying to reach Europe in 2017? Um, no, this is not true. And what, what happened in 2017 is something different. And it is this document, this is the Memorandum of Understanding on Cooperation in the Fields of De Development, the Fight Against Illegal Immigration, which the Italian Republic, um, the Italian government signed with the so-called state of Libya. Um, what it really means, what this document really means is that Italy is outsourcing the border control to an unsafe, unreliable in terms of human rights and unstable third country. And this agreement has been prolonged and is still in force. What is the role of Libya according to this agreement? Libya is Italy's watchdog and is financed with European funds and supported with Italian boats and training facilities. Uh, pushbacks uh, at Europe's border are illegal. Frontex, the, board, the European border agency, and European member states have been accused in a number of cases of, um, of illegal pushbacks at the European external borders. And with this agreement, um, there's someone else who can do the dirty job on our behalf. And in this case is Libya. What is Libya doing is shown in this uh, very short video, which I will, uh, I will show to you. And it, it is um, um, something that really cannot be acceptable uh, if we call ourselves ourselves human beings. I don't have money. So they started beating me every day, asking me to call my parents for the money, blah, blah, blah. I refuse. So they started beating me all over my body. They beat me, beat me. I called my mother. My mother put 1,005 Ghana CD for them. Even that 1,005, already they already beating me. See my hand. 
See my hand is broken. Step on it. On est venu nous prendre dans la prison que c'était du travail. En nous faisant comprendre que c'était du travail, mais en arrivant, on a constaté que c'était des armes. Mais tu es obligé de le faire. We are very worried by uh, the ongoing violations of human rights and inhumane conditions in, um, of migrants and refugees in, in Libya. In particular, those um, 4,400 of them kept in the detention, uh, detention centers. So just a couple of words uh, about the detention centers in, uh, in Libya. The detention centers are private. Uh, there's a lot of business going on there, selling and buying uh, human beings as uh, trade objects. Often people just disappear as you saw, and part of, this, of, of the business is human trafficking and uh, selling the journey to Europe for about 106, 1,600 euros each. With the compliance of the Libyan police, human traffickers bring people into international waters and um, in big ships, and then they leave them uh, in uh, small and, un and, and very dangerous rubber boats, and then uh, just force uh, unskilled migrants, uh, often minors, to uh, head towards Italy. But at a certain point, the, uh, there comes the alert of the Italian authorities to their Libyan friends and the Libyan Coast Guards with Italian boats uh, as a gift received in the last years, uh, suddenly appears to, to bring them back to Libya and or just to kill them. And um, you may wonder how, how we know this, but we know it because there are the NGOs who are witnessing all of it. Um, this is a very long video, 30 minutes of sheer horror happened on the 6th of November, 2017. I'm not gonna show it now, but I'm, I'm gonna leave the, the material for you to see. This is just one minute. This is the Libyan Coast Guard shooting at people in distress and it happened last June. And you will see how the NGOs uh, flying over the boat with their helicopter are trying to, uh, to save the migrants and how the Libyan coast uh, really perceives its scope of, uh, of violence and death. Um, and uh, again, you can, you can show it, you can see it uh, after this presentation if you are interested in it. We, we've been living four years of illegal pushbacks, interceptions, deportations, and this is, also, this is also recognized by the international organizations, uh, the International Organization for Migration and the UNHCR condemn the return of migrants and refugees to Libya. 
um, uh, I just attached here their statement. And so it is quite clear that the Libyan coast is violating human rights and it is, that it is supported by Italy and Europe in doing so. Um, migrants are trying to find their voice as well. And in these days, uh, from the beginning of October, there are more or less 4,000 migrants. Uh, they gathered in front of the UNHCR headquarters in Tripoli, um, and they are really challenging uh, the system because migration in Libya is uh, a crime. And they are demanding uh, the end of the Li Libyan violence and they wrote a, a very uh, touching letter. Um, and I, I'll try, I, I, I put it here for you to read, but there are uh, just a few lines which are so important that I will read them. We are the forgotten refugees and migrants living in Libya, presently in front of the UNHCR headquarter. After our houses got raided and most of us taken to the detention centers, we are the survivors and victims of all atrocities, torture, arbitrary detentions, false persecution, extortions, and human rights violation. We are victims of civil wars. We are victims fleeing religious and political persecutions. Amongst us are those seeking decent life, education, and freedom to live humanly. But the Italian authorities, and the EU, EU member states have been only aggravating our sorrowful soul by paying the Libyan authorities and its militia groups publicly and in the back doors to kill us while in, in the desert, on the sea and in horrible concentration camps. On the one hand, that's what Europe and Italy are doing. On the one hand, they are paying the bad fellows. And they are persecuting rescue NGOs and those responsible for good practices in terms of welcoming migrants. Uh, solidarity is a crime nowadays and those who practice it are punished with unprecedented judgments of the court so as to be an example for all the others. And I may take just uh, some more minutes to tell you the wonderful story of Mimo Lucano and Riace. Um, Riace is a small town in Calabria and it was doomed to depopulation, unemployment, 30% uh, unemployment rate, empty houses, desert streets, command of mafia. As you can see in this trailer, this is a, a docufilm uh, um, which was directed from a by a French uh, Italian director uh, um, a migrant herself. And um, I put the trailer here because you can really feel what Riace is and who Mimo Lucano is in this trailer. We, and I leave you here on the Padlet for you. This is Mimo Lucano. He, uh, he is from Riace, he is, uh, is a, a citizen of Riace. And um, in 1998, a boat with 200 Kurdish uh, migrants fleeing political, fleeing political persecutions arrived near the coast of his town. And Mimo Lucano joined in a common cause with the whole town to welcome the migrants. And he said he wanted to, um, to recall and to share a, the dream of a town based on the values of our native culture, a culture of hospitality, of openness. And he also said that there are times and when you have to make a choice and that he chose to be on the side of the poorest of the poor. In, 20, in, in 2004, he became mayor of this small town, less than 1000 uh, people. And through the welcoming of migrants, he succeeded in opening schools, bars, laboratories, bakeries, the Riace system became famous all over the world. The town's economy was rescued by the arrival of the migrants. The project created jobs in an 
hopeless area. In 2010, Lugano was classified the third best mayor in the world by the City Mayors Foundation. And in 2016, he was included in the list of the 50 most influential people in the world by Fortune magazine. Although migration laws were uh, sharpening in the ears, he kept uh, his dream, uh, he, he kept uh, working on his common dream and pursuing this goal of helping migrants to integrate and repopulate his own town. Um, the once desert town became a global village uh, and with filmmakers and intellectual and musicians going to pay a tribute to this system. But it was a capital sin, turning a depressed town under the rule of mafia into a global village of solidarity and freedom, an example of humanity and hope against xenophobia, racism, and fear. The 2nd of October, 2016, he paid uh, what he, he had dreamt for and he was put under house arrest and suspended as a mayor. Lucano was charged with abuse of office extortion and aggravated fraud. He was also accused of arranging fake uh, false marriages uh, just to have migrant, uh, just to let the migrant have the right to stay. And evidently being uh, um, political, uh, judgment as compared to the not inconsistent uh, uh, evidence brought to court, a wave of solidarity started immediately. And this is the, 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 the demonstration we, uh, we uh, had in Riace in 2018. And he, could have, he was invited all over Europe to uh, talk about the system and this, uh, the, the, the political persecution he was living. Last, the last, uh, on last 30th September, uh, the court sentenced Lucano to 13 years and two months of prison, when even the prosecutor was asking for seven years and 11 months. Uh, maybe the first uh, example in our judicial system. And this is how they reduced a humble dreamer Again, uh, the public opinion, opinion has uh, uh, made its voice, its voice uh, heard. And there is a, a, a letter, an open letter of solidarity with Mimo Lucano, which, go, which is uh, uh, going around Europe. And my movement, uh, the movement in which I am uh, currently uh, working, is Le Veglie Contro le Morti in Mare. And I am happy to show you this picture. This picture was taken this morning in Riace. Le Veglie, uh, the association Le Veglie went there to show uh, the solidarity to Mimo Lucano. This is Mimo and this, these are the, the children. Uh, they are now uh, fully integrated in, the, uh, in, the, in this little town of Calabria. Um, I'm going to close my contribution just saying in a nutshell what is going on. Europe is patrolling the Mediterranean through its border agency Frontex, responsible for systemic human rights violation and involvement in deportation. The EU, the EU border policies are inherently racist and reinforce colonial and capital capitalist structures. Italy. Italy is outsourcing border control to criminals, providing funds, boats, and training. What we ask is the abolishment of the border agency Frontex and of the EU border regime. What, it, what we ask is a radical change of the system because we no longer tolerate the violent and deathly policies that offend our sense of humanity. We consider migrants as our brothers and sisters and in the language or paradigm of the maternal gift economy, we consider them our sons and daughters, abandoned from the, uh, from the rest of mankind adrift because the land is unjust. Um, and I would like to close this little contribution of mine with the words of an intellectual 
we're not alone. We, it, we are, uh, uh, it's, the movement is made up of common people, of intellectuals, uh, uh, um, religious, non-religious people. And I'm, I'd like to leave uh, the, the last thought, to give the last thought to the migrants who, who died in the sea through the words of Erri de Luca, who is um, an activist and a, a writer. nostro che non sei nei cieli e abbracci i confini dell'isola e del mondo si è benedetto il tuo sale si è benedetto il tuo fondale accogli le gremite imbarcazioni senza una strada sopra le tue onde i pescatori usciti nella notte le loro reti tra le tue creature che tornano al mattino con la pesca dei naufraghi salvati. Mare nostro che non sei nei cieli e all'alba sei colore del frumento, al tramonto dell'uvia di vendemmia. Ti abbiamo seminato di annegati più di qualunque età delle tempeste. Mare nostro che non sei nei cieli, tu sei più giusto della terraferma, pure quando sollevi onde a muraglia, poi le abbassi a tappeto. Custodisci le vite, le visite cadute come foglie sul viale. Mare nostro che non sei nei cieli, fai da autunno per loro. La carezza d'abbraccio bacio in fronte di madre e padre prima di partire. Um, yeah. Uh, this was what I needed from the deep of my heart to share with you, and um, I hope I'll have the chance, the, the, the possibility to um, see your comments on the Padlet, which I'm, I'm going to, to put the link here in the chat, and uh, to keep in touch so as to be stronger together. Thank you very much for that, Cecilia. It's really important for us, those of us who are not on the coast, to understand the gravity of what is going on. It's just um, such a tragedy. And I really appreciate you bringing out that it is through the maternal gift economy, our values that are the deepest, that we see each of these people who are trying to flee these very, very difficult challenges as our sons, our daughters, our brothers, our sisters, our uncles, our parents, etc. So thank you so much. That was um, in some ways very difficult, but also um, it opens our heart to really be able to experience and know um, what is necessary to be changed. And we need that radical change. So if you would just take a minute, those of you who are viewing with us to just breathe, I'm gonna give you about a minute to just take that in. And I want you to understand that Cecilia is an activist who is heading up and helping to um, make a radical change for us. And during the question and answers, she will be able to tell you what we can do to support this effort and how we can stay connected to ensure that on that border coast, especially in Libya, that those atrocities are not forgotten, that they can be transformed and changed. So just breathe a minute, take it in and get yourself a glass of water. 
and then I will introduce Jennifer in a minute. And just, re just remember that you're you're um, safe in your home and that sometimes we have to face these very, very difficult challenges before we can make the changes. So we're going to move now from the European border challenges to um, what we're seeing here on the southern border of the United States. Um, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Long and Rosalinda Dardone Game, who is from El Salvador. Um, Jennifer Long is the co-executive director of Casa Mariana and program director of the adult shelter, shelter since 1998. She oversees all the programs, administration and development for the organization. Jennifer first got interested in working with my immigrants and refugees while working with groups who opposed US military aid to Central America in the early 1980s. She has, was drawn to directly help the people impacted by US policy and other forms of injustice. She enjoys the close personal connection that working at a shelter provides. She also enjoys working with young people who commit to doing a year of service at Casa Marinana. Jennifer has a BA in social philosophy from the University of California at Santa Cruz. She has an MA in ESL from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, Rosa Linda, uh, is a native Spanish speaker. So when she speaks, Jennifer will be translating for us. And so I'm going to hand it off to you, Jennifer. And for those of you with us today in the Zoom room, we're traveling far in just a few minutes. So grab your seats and welcome, Jennifer. Um. I, Cecilia, thank you so much for your really heavy hearted and really sad. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid we're, we're not really traveling very far because we're dealing with the exact same crisis here in Texas that you're dealing with in Italy. And, and I think in general, the problem is that we need to be dealing with the problem of, of people being displaced as a planet. We can't do it as individual countries. I know the pressure on Italy was tremendous. Um, the pressure on Texas has been tremendous. And because we don't have a global idea of how we're going to grapple with this, what are we going to do? Because we know that this placement is only going to increase as climate change accelerates. Um, so very, very sad to hear your story. And, and Unfortunately, we have the same story. I mean, the United States is also paying Mexico to keep people from getting to our border, and we're doing everything we can to divert people so we don't have to bother with it. Um, and Rosa Lydia and many others who come to our border because they can't live wherever they came from for whatever catastrophic reason has pushed them is, is facing journey to the United States. And then once they arrive at the border, if they're allowed to apply for asylum, put in prison. And uh, most recently, Rosa Lydia spent 481 days in a detention center before she came to us. But um, to start with, I'd like to show the film. Um, it's called Welcome to Casa Marianella, and it features a man from Eritrea. The same, the very same. I mean, all the guys on those boats you were showing, those are all the residents at Casa Marianella. The majority of people now in our shelter are coming from Africa. Um, and um, this is a, a short video, which is from of, of Tecle and talks a little bit about our services. So um, while we're waiting for that, I just want to give a shout out to Jen. Um, Jen Vaughn was one of the first funders of Casa Marianella back in 1986. Um, she actually funded our very first staff member. And I'm not sure that without that contribution, we would still be here today, 35 years later, working out of the same little house. We now work out of nine houses here in Austin, Texas, but 
Um, Jen, you're a very important part of getting us started. So um, very, very grateful for that. Um, so um, let me go ahead and introduce you to Rosa Lydia while we're waiting to see if the video will work. Are we still working on that? But this is Rosa Lydia. And um, Rosa Lydia, tu puedes decir que hicieron cuando llegaste a los Estados Unidos? Can you tell us what happened when you arrived in the United States? Sí, o sea que yo cuando venía en, la, en el trayecto del paso malo, ¿verdad? So when I was crossing Mexico, I encountered a great failure. Okay. Okay, so the way it works when you're on the southern border um, with the smugglers is that you pay a certain amount and you get three chances to try to cross the border. And I owed the second half of the money in order to be taken all the way to Houston, and I wasn't able to pay it. So they pulled me out of the house at six in the morning. Entonces, uh, tuvieron hasta las, como a la una de la madrugada y en el monte. Fueron unas personas, well, that took me out into the the forest uh, until about one in the morning. Yeah. De los pies, de las manos, así. Eh, hicieron lo que hicieron conmigo. Me dejaron so they tied my arms and my legs and, and did what they wanted to do with me and then left me there. So I was able to get up and get to a highway. Entonces, it's a it's a highway that they call the turtle. And I got picked up by a gray truck. And this person told me I could get in. He was going to San Isidro. But I don't know. Maybe that person, I, I'm not really sure. Maybe he was um, part of their group. And so basically, he just turned me in to immigration, and I spent 481 days uh, detained. So the food there is really terrible. They get you up at five in the morning to eat oatmeal with water. Eso es muy triste porque después de sufrir todo el trayecto que uno, que yo paso Guatemala. It's super sad because after all you've been through, going all the way through Guatemala. Tengo cicatrices porque yo me entregué, o sea, cuando yo intenté por primera vez, me entré a, al tren. And, and I have scars because the first time I came, I, I was on the train. Me quise montar y cuando me quise yo soltar, me arrastró un, un tanto y ahí es donde me molesté la canilla. And I, I injured my knee when I was trying to jump off of it. Sí, es muy triste todo lo que uno sufre porque aguanta hambre en el camino. And it's so sad what you go through because you're hungry on the journey. 
ya después me tuvieron ese tiempo, me anduvieron en cinco detenciones. And they moved me around to five different detention centers. Primero en San Isidro, después en San Diego. From San Isidro to San Diego. Eh, Santana, San... eh, Musing, y adelante. Musing and Anto. Okay, un momento. Um, so, um, the United States has this really uh, crazy system. Um, we do have an asylum program, but there is no infrastructure to support it. So we either get people, we get people two different ways at Casa Marinella. We either get people directly from detention centers who have contacted us um, and write letters of inviting them to come stay with us, or they come straight from the border. Sometimes people are released directly at the border, but if when the people are released, they're not given any housing, they're not given any social services, they're not given any legal aid, and they're not given a work permit. It's taking people now a year and a half to two years to get a work permit, and, 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 and argue a legal case when they can't even find a job. Uh, so we at Casa Marinella are working within this very broken system in the United States, and we're one of the only shelters of our kind in the country um, that is actually providing housing to asylum seekers. We have a great program for refugees, and I hope that all the Afghans who are arriving are, are getting treated decently, but people who are coming to the border from all over the world um, are definitely not getting the treatment. So let's look next at the video. I think it's I was uh, prisoned when I was in Eritrea because of my political situation. In Eritrea, uh, there is no freedom of speech, there is no freedom of beliefs, there is no freedom of movement, there is no freedom of travel from place to uh, place. When I arrived in the United States, I was detained for almost 10 months. Tekle came to us like everybody did, having been in detention for 10 months, where the conditions are very difficult. He wasn't. He wasn't able to see the sunshine for many hours of the day. Food was inadequate, people were crowded, and everyone in detention is feeling very hopeless and scared. Many people in detention are uh, talking about Casa Marianila, and many people are saying it's helpful to go to Casa Marianila if you don't have, uh, don't have family. Casa Marinella is a shelter for people who come to the border of the United States seeking safety, and those people are seeking asylum in the United States. Our mission is to welcome people and provide food and shelter while also helping people gain self-sufficiency so that they can be successful on their own. When I came to Casa Marinella, uh, they start hugging me, they start treating me very well, and they, was, they were happy. I think one of the most important things that CASA provides is a community because when people arrive it's not just the staff that are here but there is a community of people from all over the world that are here and they're all going through the exact same thing and they support one another and frankly they are the most hospitable. I felt family you know I, I, I was feeling that I came to my family. So in addition to food and shelter we also provide English classes and legal services. We have an acupuncture clinic. We have a benefits clinic to help people get health insurance. We provide case management for each individual, and we have a bike program to help people get transportation. We are learning how to prepare for the future. I am preparing uh, for life, for next life, and I am learning how to live. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I looked at all the faces of those guys in the boats and they're, they, they could have been the residents of Casa Marianella right now. It's just so incredibly heartbreaking to think about um, what's happening on the Mediterranean, what's happening in the Sahara Desert before people ever get to Libya, um, what's happening in Mexico and Guatemala, the amount of trafficking that's going on of, of women like Rosalidia that are, that are trying to get across Mexico, um, and the tremendous amount of trauma that that we, the richest countries in the history of the world, are, are causing because we're not really willing to step up to the plate. And, and frankly, it's not, not just our countries, it's not just Europe and the United States, but really the whole world, uh, which needs to be thinking so much more seriously about how are we gonna make room for all these people that are gonna be displaced from our coasts? And how are we gonna do it without so many people losing their lives? 
Of course, we just had the example of the Haitians arriving at our border. And many of those people had been in Chile for 10 years. There, there are people all over Latin America, of course, living um, who have come from other countries as well. But with the drop in the economy due to COVID, the folks who were the, the Haitians who were there were being forced out. And at the same time, our president said, oh, we're going to give temporary protected status to Haitians. And so they thought, oh, boy, let's go. Well, the temporary protected status ended in July before anyone left Chile. And so we end up with 10,000 people on our border and no, as I said, infrastructure other than a prison system. And so what do we do? We deported these people back to Haiti who hadn't been there for 10 years. And Haiti had no capacity to receive them back either. So um, absolutely cruel, um, completely unacceptable policies. Our prisons are also run by private companies. Um, the private companies are making a tremendous amount of money and hiring lobbyists who are then developing policies in Washington for how we should treat immigrants for their own profits, which is completely upside down and backwards. So um, at any rate, um, that, that is the situation that we're facing here at Casa Marianella. Um, and um, let me get Mosa Lydia to tell you about the next, next chapter of her story. Um, Después, cuando te, te pasaron, te dieron monitor, ¿verdad? Sí, después de, te le voy a explicar. Eh, después de que me tuvieron todo ese tiempo allí, me pusieron una fianza de 10 mil dólares. So after I had been all that time in a detention center, they gave me a bond of $10,000. And, and a lot of the detention centers, even though most of those people get deported, the people that they're willing to release, who they've determined you have a good case, you're not a danger, they're, they're still charging the money to be released. So they asked for $10,000 to be released from detention. Después el, el juez me dijo que los abogados González habían bajado a 7,000, pero yo le dije, ya no voy a salir con el monitor. Sí, me dice, va a salir. Anduve 10, 10 meses ese monitor. So, so they, my, my lawyer was able to get the bond down to $7,000. Um, someone paid that bond. And then I said, well, because we paid, I paid the bond, then I don't have to have an ankle monitor, right? And they said, no, you are going to have an ankle monitor as well. And so I had the ankle monitor for 10 months. Entonces, el, ¿con qué motivo me sacó? Porque me puso esa fianza, pero no me dio documentos. Estoy todavía sin documentos aquí. So, th so they charged me all that money to get out, but then they didn't give me any documents. Um, I still don't have any documents. Si no fuera este ángel que tengo aquí a la par, yo no, no tuviera apoyo de nada. If it weren't for Casa Marianela, I wouldn't have any support. Casa Marianela es... Como, como una casa humanitaria que no anda viendo raza, color. So Casa Marinella is a house where they're not. Ay, no aguantamos hambre porque vienen a donar mucha comida, mucha ropa. And we're not hungry because people come and bring donations of food and clothing. Pero si nosotros tuvimos so, so we wouldn't leave our countries if we could live there. If if we had to do, we could survive. And I really feel for the folks who come from Africa who go through more than ten countries. Me dio tristeza ver ese video porque como tienen ese corazón de tirar a una gente como and, que sean los animales. And it made me gente. so sad to see that video of the people out on the water and to think that they are being killed like animals. Yo tengo una hija y por eso me atrevo a mandarla a traer porque es mi única princesa. Mamá Jennifer la conoce. And so I have a daughter, but it's too who's in El Salvador, but it's too dangerous to bring her. And, and something like what happened to me happened to her back in El Salvador because the MS-13s kidnapped her and raped her. Right now, 
la tendilla. Los que me la sacaron a ella fueron los de la Mara MS. She was rescued by the 18th Street gang, now by the MS-13, so she was actually in her own home from the gang that controlled her neighborhood. So now she's had to move out to the countryside to live with a family. And so I, I appreciate the fact that um, not like just a person, but like like a family member. Okay, you could have this. I think um, I think that's basically our presentation. I think our time is up. Is that right? We go on. Yes, but Jeff um, I, I I do want to clarify one thing about Russell Lydia. Russell Lydia and I have been friends for many years, and although she gets really emotional, she actually really appreciates being able to tell her story because. Um, you know, it's, it's when you, when you go, your people have gone through something similar, no one thinks what you went through was a very big deal. And so it's very gratifying to her to be able to tell the story to people who are horrified on her behalf. So, um, please think that she's like doing this against her will or feeling horrible about it. She, she really appreciates the fact that to get to speak to you. Perdón. Thank you so much, Rosalinda, for sharing your story and Jennifer Long for the work that you're doing there at Casa Marinella. Um, we really appreciate you uh, presenting today along with Cecilia. Um, and before we actually open up uh, to questions and answers, um, Jen, this has been a passion of yours to get us um, to have this salon on immigration. And I'm wondering if you might sort of make this bridge uh, with the gift economy, how you saw it in your heart, why you thought, you know, what is it about the gift economy and this immigration issue? You put a little bit about it in the chat. If we hadn't exploited the countries of the South, the people, could still be living at home. Could you just say a little bit more about that? Because this is a global systemic problem as Jennifer pointed out and Cecilia also began to paint the picture there. It's a long ongoing um, power struggle in the world. So Jen, would you like to offer some words to that so that people can understand why you felt it was so important for us to know these two stories in particular. Yes, thank you, Letitia. And thank you so much, Cecilia and Jennifer and Rosa. Um, we do have a very exploitative economy and uh, it has values which are anti-human and we are involved in that and we support it. Even if we're nice people living in our own houses in our own small lives, we are supporting this larger picture of, of exploitation and racism and let's call it even murder because it, that's what it is on a large scale of, of one group against another. And if we're going to survive at all as a species, we have to change those values and start being kind to each other and being welcoming and do the gifting values, have the gifting values and the gifting practice where we welcome people and where we bring them and, and give to them as, and circulate the gifts that we have with everybody and that they have with everybody. We can't live like this as a, as a planet. We are just self-destructing. And we are, all of the wonderful people, all of the great human beings that could have been our friends that get killed on the way to come to where we are. It's just, it's a very, really a terrible thing. So we do have in our hands the possibility 
of change and we need to do it. So thank you so much for bringing your stories and telling us about it all. Thank you, Jen. I think it's really important that Jen points out that we, you know, when we look at our maternal values and if we make the, the, um, the choices that we make in our political influences from that point of view of what it means to be human, that we can easily make the change in the right direction. So um, really just take a breath. Those are very, very difficult stories. And many of us who are viewing haven't had these kinds of atrocities or um, may not have spent much time on the front um, where we're actually helping at this direct level. So just take a minute. And while you're taking a minute and a breath and getting yourself some water, think about some questions that you might have. And uh, as we promised, uh, Jennifer has already, uh, we've already put up some solutions where you can directly help some people. And Cecilia will also give us some information before we close today. Um, so just take a breath and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. Um, and shall we start with maybe Liliana first? Yes, I have a question for Rosalidia. Rosalidia, um, ¿Qué te hizo decidir venirte a Estados Unidos? What, what made your decision to leave to the United States? What was the event? ¿Cuál fue el evento que te empujó a venirte a Estados Unidos? Por la pobreza, mi hija, ella era hueso de territoriados. Eh, tenía una enfermedad que le iba a costar 35 mil dólares Okay, so um, I have one child and she was born with a disability and the treatment for the disability was going to cost $35,000. And then, and then you have the gangs who make it impossible to have a business because if you try to open a business, they charge you rent, which is extortion. So I hoped that my daughter would get better and I took her to doctors. Her, her bones weren't formed right and she had difficulty learning to walk and I just hoped that she would be able to walk. So at three years old, she was able to start walking at four and a half. And I thought so I was thinking that because it was dangerous where my mom was living, that we could buy a place that would be safer. And so I left her and I begged God to help me to be safe, to make it to the United States. And I spent three months on the journey. And, and I was able to arrive. Okay. Okay. So that's the letter. I think that's the answer to your question. Thank you so much for that. And um, I don't know if you've met our friend or you know of our friend, Marta Benavides, who's down in El Salvador. And maybe we can connect you up with her to see if there's a network that can support your daughter there. Um, but yes, that's a, oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that we can, you know, create that bridge. Um, thank you, Liliana, for that question. Judith, um, mm-hmm. is there a question that you might have? Uh, Paula asks, uh, talks about, um, 
uh, Europe being the originator of human rights and um, then uh, moving away from it, uh, deserting the uh, human rights and, and that they're now out of fashion and uh, suggest that we need to restore human rights um, and move to another economy, perhaps a maternal economy. And um, so she, she has an open question of how do we go about doing that? Oh, right. Okay. Um, is that, uh, Jen, would you like to uh, start there and maybe um, Cecilia and Jennifer can add their insights? Well, as I said before, I think we have to change the values. We have to realize that as human beings, this is not what we really are. We're really a maternal species because all children have to be mothered when they're little. And so they get that model. And then we have the model of the exchange and the market that takes over. And, and, and that we have this whole me first thing where everybody's competing to be the biggest and the best. And uh, if we can move that value system uh, away from control of everybody's mind, uh, then, then we can make a, a good economy. But as it is, uh, we keep going through the same thing over and over again. And the powerful keep getting more powerful and the poor get, get, get screwed always. And so the, our, our, our neoliberal values, our neoliberal economy is, gets recycled every time back. It, it, it fails and then it gets recycled and they make it even worse every time. And, and the environment is telling us that we can't live this way. This is not possible. So if you, uh, if anyone has any other ideas? Cecilia, uh, yes, I, I know you have a practical uh, application and maybe you have some other words to offer also. Yeah, um, I have a practical application which refers to the group Le Velle. Um, they are launching this kind of action. Whenever a boat is in danger uh, on the sea, we are going to uh, share an, uh, an alarm uh, in all Italian cities, in Berlin, in Frankfurt, in Germany, and we are going out on the streets with the, the uh, coordinates of the ship uh, in the sea. We are going to write emails to all Italian politicians and European representatives. We will paste the same text. We, will, we are going to tell them these people are about to die. You will be responsible as an individual. As an individual, if you do not, uh, if you don't do anything to help those people, you have to face your own responsibility of complicity in a murder. This is something we are going to spread out all over Europe. And we are launching uh, both um, present action, physical action, where we are in the streets, if we have people coming out with us, or with social bombing of all the emails of these representatives. And I'll uh, give you the link of the uh, Facebook page of the association in the chat, so that you can get in contact. And whenever brothers, sisters, sons and daughters are in danger in the water, we won't abandon them. We will do what is needed to save them. We won't have our bad conscience as Europe uh, does. And just about this, uh, what, what can we do? I think there are two levels. One is an individual level. As Genevieve said, we are all good persons, but we were raised with the milk of, of capitalism and consumerism. We have to work on ourselves because we have latent colonialism in our minds. We have to develop another kind of human awareness, which we, are not, we, we don't have at, at this time. But at the same time, I think that I, I don't believe in the end of history, as, uh, as some philosophers said, this is not going, capitalism is not going to be the end of our history. 
it has started and it will end. And it depends on us what, what will come after this desert, this, uh, um, this climate of destruction that capitalism brings with itself. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And thank you for um, making us aware of this um, Facebook page that we can all connect with. And Jennifer, do you have any suggestions of, on the oh. southern border? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. I, I believe that um, we absolutely have the capacity to behave in motherly and humane fashion toward our brothers and sisters, who are clearly our brothers and sisters on our southern border. And, and we're absolutely not doing it. But I'm thinking that for our closing, it, and, and in light of that, and in terms of uh, feminist thinking, uh, it would be good to watch the other video that we had, which is just a couple of minutes long. It was made by some University of Texas students and was designed to produce a Spanish speaking person to our shelter. And so it's a good introduction to our own uh, motherly approach to doing work. Can we, can we hook up the other video now, the one that we, were, that we came on first? Welcome to Casa Mariano. Bienvenidos a Casa Marianela. Welcome to Casa. Bienvenidos a Casa Marianela. Casa Marianela es un albergue de emergencia para refugiados e inmigrantes que ha existido desde 1986. Hemos tenido personas de más de 40 países diferentes, incluyendo Eritrea, Honduras, Camerún y Cuba. Estamos para ayudarle mientras usted hace una transición exitosa a los Estados Unidos. Mientras está en casa, queremos que sepa algunas cosas importantes. Casa Marianela es un lugar seguro. Somos una familia cariñosa y abierta, todos con historias y experiencias muy diferentes, aprendiendo a cómo vivir juntos en paz. Estamos aquí no solo para ayudarle, pero más importante también para empoderarlo a usted en hacer lo que necesita para adaptarse a este nuevo país. Por ejemplo, un trabajador siempre está en casa las 24 horas del día, los 7 días de la semana. Les ayudamos con el acceso a beneficios, servicios legales, medicina occidental y un programa de bicicletas. Además, le asignaremos una encargada que va a ayudarle como pueda y encontrarse con usted regularmente para ver su progreso mientras que navega su situación y necesidades. En casa, los residentes tienen acceso a la cocina para guardar comida y cocinar y también tienen acceso a la lavadora para lavar su ropa. En la oficina siempre hay café y huevos. Ten en cuenta que Casa Marianela es un lugar para muchas personas. Tomamos orgullo en el cuidado de nuestra casa y le pedimos que haga lo mismo que nosotros. De lunes a jueves de 7 y media a 9 pm tenemos clases de inglés. Las clases son para mejorar su inglés y también para enseñarles las costumbres y maneras de vida en los Estados Unidos. Proveemos una cena cada noche a las 6. También tenemos una junta a las 10 p.m. cada noche. El último domingo de cada mes tenemos un evento llamado Convivio en Casa. Residentes pasados y presentes, voluntarios y todos los trabajadores de casa se reúnen. Tenemos música y comida africana y latina. Son noches muy bonitas y de beneficio para conocer a otras personas. Finalmente, sabemos que aquí no va a estar por siempre y le animamos a que piense de su tiempo aquí como un paso más cerca a su futuro. Sea bienvenido. Estamos honrados de ser una parte de su vida y esperamos que el tiempo que pase en este hogar con nuestra familia le haga sentirse empoderado y lleno de esperanza en frente de su futuro.
Welcome to Houty Marianela. It's a congratulation for the people inside. It's nice. You come back. It's at your house. Thank you so much for that, Jennifer. It's very beautiful. The the um uh the whole issue of immigration is not just about the immigration issue. Jen is pointing out that it really is about how our political will needs to shift and our focus needs to be not just on this back end where it's beautiful. Um, we have to have services to be able to receive the immigrants who are being forced out of their countries. And we also need to try to use our political will to force our politicians locally and globally so that the countries can stay safe. So um, I think those are some of the things that we need to think about. It's not one place, it has to happen at many different levels. Um, my sister, I just wanna share just a, a small story. In the United States, when they come, they're held in detention centers. And if there isn't a family here, um, you have to receive, somebody has to come and take them out of the detention center. So I'll find out the sources. This is in California where my sister has volunteered to actually go and pick up people at different detention centers within a, a two and a half hour, three hour area from her home and then they have to have a place that they go to be received. So if they don't have family of their own, there's a whole series of steps that has to be taken. And um, it sounds like Casa Marianella is one of those places that people can come after they leave the detention center, but they still need to have somebody who will bring them from the detention center to Casa Marianella. So that's another little step that you can actively do. I'm, I'm not sure how that works, Cecilia, in your area when they come to a detention center, what happens to them there in, in Italy? Um, we have had a very bad period between uh, 2017 and 2018 uh, up to 2020 uh, because the so-called uh, um, migrants crisis pushed uh, the um, political power of uh, far right parties, mm. which uh, which actually are successful because they use the fear people have and the the threat they feel when uh, um, newcomers arrive and when the the, the country is um, in terms of uh, job market is not uh, good. So uh, our, our parties of the far right have had the possibility to, uh, to, to give some very restrictive laws and our, um, they were called camps, they, they, they became detention uh, centers. We have uh, two uh, kinds of uh, um, uh, systems of, of welcoming my, migrants. One is called CAS, which is a center, a private center, and one is called SPRAR, which is uh, which is managed by a municipality, for example. The example of Riace as a system was a SPRAR, a common um, um, system of welcoming migrants, and it worked, and it showed uh, the, the, the world that it is possible to live uh, in, a, in, in a just way, welcoming migrants and uh, letting them enter your own uh, collective corp, collective body. Cas have been um, and still are those places where private profit is made. And in that centers, uh, the situation of migrants is not, um, does not uh, respect human rights many times. Uh, for example, during the COVID, uh, COVID period, um, 
it was impossible to respect distance between people because these places are full of, of, of uh, migrants well above the um, real capacity of the place. And when they arrived, uh, just as, as, uh, as uh, Jennifer said, just to have your legal permission to stay, you have to wait years and you can't work. In my own town, there was a cast with more or less 99 girls and they were young adults, young adults uh, mainly coming from Nigeria um, uh, and some coming from Bangladesh and Pakistan. For two years, they stayed in that sort of, uh, of, uh, of uh, accommodations uh, facility without doing nothing, asking for participate in the, co in the common life of, of my town. And out of, the, out of the center, so that people didn't have much occasion to, to meet them. Those are ghettos. The, uh, the migrant, uh, the welcoming of migrants in our, uh, in our countries are ghettos in the best of the possibilities. They are not, there, there are no facilities to help those people really feel that they belong to this, to the community they chose to go to. Thank you for giving us a, an insight into that challenge. Um, I think that it's it's such a complicated thing. Liliana, did you have a question or a comment that you'd like to insert here? At this yeah, I have time? A, a question for Cecilia. Cecilia, um, can you explain to me why you spoke about that town that became prosperous because of the migrants and then they detained the mayor? And so for capitalist ideas, that would be a perfect situation that the town was abandoned and then these people came and they work and everything. I don't understand why they will stop this and create this kind of, not use it as a model if that was really working. It's kind of incomprehensible to me that they will attack a situation of solidarity. Um, yes, thank you for, for the, this question, which gives me the possibility to clarify a little bit what is happening in Riace. Um, uh, Riace is in Calabria. We are um, generally under the rule of mafia. And once uh, in the past, mafia was uh, a separate body from institutions. But in, uh, in it evolved and it... it, it uh, started to uh, make agreement with institutions. And it, um, th there is a sort of um, mutual benefit in keeping the South of Italy in poor conditions uh, and ignorant, uncultured, and poor. Um, in Riace, the situation uh, was challenging the system because it gave people hope for the future. It gave people the awareness of uh, the possibility to um, to live to live with uh, jobs, with uh, with uh, uh, common facilities like schools. They they could create their own town with their forces without having industries or without having uh, um, external uh, investors. And it was a challenge to mafia because all, all the, the, the money which was circulating was uh, clean money. Uh, for example, in collecting uh, waste, Mimo Lucano decided to give this, uh, this service to migrants and they did it with donkeys in, in, in the town. And one of the, of the main sources of money for the mafia in the South is the waste business. And uh, this was, this was a, a high offense to the system. And for example, Mimo Lucano printed fake money for the community. 
with the faces of Che Guevara, with the faces of Peppino Impastato, and so on. And when, when the money for, from the central administration for this system was late, this kind of fake, of fake money circulated in town with the promise, I will give you the money when we receive it. It was becoming independent. It was becoming self-satisfying um, as, as, a, as a system. And if, if we can do it from the base, if we can really shape our own local communities, what is going capitalism do? How does it, does, it, does it go on without our own consensus? Thank you, Cecilia. Yeah, that makes it clear. So the mafia and the local government colluded because they wanted to create the dependency and keep the poor dependent on the services of the mafia and uh, the local government rather than creating a local economy and have a sustainable environment where they could thrive. That is just a travesty. It's horrible. And I hope that that turns around. Um, yeah, that is, it's a great model. Um, and even if it's not effective there, that in other places it can be transplanted and it can thrive. Yes, thank you. Um, Judith, do you have a question for us? I have a very uh, quick question. I just wondered uh, the name Marianella, is that a person or, or where did that come from? Um, okay, so um, Rosa Lydia has a question also, but let me answer the first question. Um, Casimir, uh, Marianela Garcia Villas was a woman who um, was a human rights attorney in El Salvador, and um, she was investigating the use of white phosphorus on the volcanoes where villagers were getting out from the military, and she was killed in a massacre. Um, and she, um, someone had heard of her, I think actually the person that Jen hired, Jackie Starnes, uh, knew about uh, Marianella. And so we named it for her, which has been wonderful. So Marianella looks over us and she's in our mural. Um, and, and Rosa Lydia has a question. Okay, so Rosa Lydia wants to know, um, she said, since I'm a single mother, some people call me a gorilla mother, um, and uh, what, what, what do you guys know about how I can bring my daughter to the United States? And there is no answer to this question, but um, if anyone wants to give it a try, go for it. It's, there's no, there is no way to do it to my knowledge, but um, she's always was, would like to know if anyone has any ideas. Well, I have an idea. I think that maybe if we actually uh, connect you, if you haven't already, I said this before, mm -hmm. is with, uh, uh, Marta Benavides, that maybe that Marta there can be some, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe there can be some action there. I don't know if the, and anyone else who would like mm -hmm. to answer that question, maybe we can send it, uh, you know, you can send it to maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com and we'll, we'll make sure that uh, your answer gets to Rosa Linda. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank You're you. very welcome. Um, Liliana, do you have a question? Yes, I do. I have a question for both of the speakers. For all the, uh, the work that you do, uh, for all the things that you have seen and the horror stories like Rosa, do you think, this is for both of you, and even for Jen, do you think that human beings are inherently evil? They always seem to win. Anyway, that's my question. Uh, Cecilia, would you like to go first to answer that question? Yeah, human beings are in inherently nothing else than the choices they make. And in this sense, 
We are not born with evil or all evil or, or good. We can make a choice between the two with our actions. Thank you. Um, I, I, think, I think that I like to believe that humans are inherently good. I, I do believe that, in, that capitalism is, is terrible and that capitalism corrupts people and societies and is the heart of the problem that we have in the United States. Um, and, and it has infected many parts of the world. And I think that's unfortunate because even good people um, as, as mentioned at the beginning, we, we're all part of this system and we're all infected by it. But I do believe that we have the capacity for goodness. Thank you. Jen. Yeah, I believe that babies are taken care of by mothers and it has to be unilateral. Mothers have to see the needs that children have because uh, and satisfy them because children can't give back an exchange for what they get. And they don't learn that until quite a few years uh, after their infancy and after they've learned this maternal model. And what happens, I think, is that our, our uh, exchange system, our system of the market, is kind of like a parasite on our maternal model. And uh, that it, it, we don't know that's happening, but it ch really changes our values. And so we are actually born and learn as children to be homo donans, that is the giving being. And then as we grow older, we start thinking we're even homo economicus. We're not uh, giving and receiving beings. We're people that only give in order to receive. It's all quid pro quo. And uh, we have just built our society on that. And we are not homo sapiens, which means the knowing being, because we don't know that's what we're doing. But we're being driven towards a, a negative behavior by the system we're part of. And not only is it the exchange system and capitalism, it's the patriarchal values that are mixed up with it. So I think that we are basically good, uh, uh, what we call good. It is giving and receiving that is really in harmony with nature rather than being into, uh, you know, making people give to us just uh, so then not have anything free. So, yeah. Thank you, Jen. Judith, do you have a question for us? Uh, I heard yesterday um, that there were three causes, this was in an interview on the radio, three causes for, of, uh, for creating refugees, conflicts, climates, and COVID. I wonder if you could um, comment on, on what is refugee producing? Any one of us could answer that? Yes, any one of you can answer that. In fact, it, um, each well, the of main, you. The main, the main causes that, that people identify when talking to us um, include um, gang violence, which was exported, by the way, from the United States to Central America during the Central American Wars. And we take no responsibility for that fact. Um, political violence, especially in many parts of Africa um, where people are killed for um, speaking out. And um, economic violence when people can't survive in their own country. And that's both a product of climate change and of unjust structures um, that have made many economies impossible. Um, and, you know, much of Central America is becoming a desert and um, many, many more people are going to be headed this way of necessity. Thank you, Jennifer. Cecilia, what are your thoughts on any of that? We, uh, when I was in the South of Italy and I uh, worked as a, uh, as a volunteer in these centers, we received the very same uh, uh, causes. Uh, that uh, Jennifer is reporting. Many of the, um, the young adults in, of the uh, sub-Saharan area um, 
where um, actually um, it was a po political persecution because those states are usually uh, under the rule of some uh, fake uh, representative of uh, Western countries' interests. <laughs> and they make money and they, uh, they, they stay in power for years and years year and years. There is no dem democracy. And with spreading of, the, of technology, I, I, I don't know if you remember what we called, and I don't know if in English it is called the Arabic Springs, uh, which was this, uh, this, this, where those movements which uh, demanded for democracy and uh, just were just upheaval all around the, uh, those areas. And uh, there is, a, there is a, a raising awareness around the world uh, of um, human rights. And people are now knocking on the doors <laughs> asking for having those human rights, which we uh, really with hypocrisy uh, say uh, to, uh, to be considered as, to be, to, as fundamental for our, our civilization. Then they want to take part in a democratic um, uh, life, which is not possible in their states, but it is not possible because of us as well. Thank you, Cecilia. Jen, did you have any other thoughts that you wanted to input here at this juncture on no, this question? No, no, no? no, no. Okay. Uh, Liliana, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question for Rosa. Rosa, um, ¿cuál es la relación del gobierno con las con la, uh, pandillas en El Salvador? What is the relationship between the government of El Salvador and the, and the gang? And the gangs that are running, are they doing anything about it? Are they part of it? Son parte del gobierno, o por qué las dejan correr libres y que hagan lo que quieran? El gobierno es un, perdón con lo que le voy a decir, es un corrupto porque la gente no 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 echa de ver con cómo se pone la gorra y un solo demostró que es de la pandilla también. So um. The government is corrupt, and I don't know if you've noticed, but he even puts his hat on backwards like the gang members. Ahorita, él dice que él está administrando la pandilla, pero no, él está comprando la pandilla. So the president says that he is managing the gangs, but he is actually paying off the gangs. Porque ahorita los, los que, pues sí, no, no quiero decir yo porque... Él está matando, mandando a matar a los que se visten así de mujer y entonces uh, eso no está bueno. Porque... He's also he's also having transgender people killed and that's really bad. Todos los días amanecen muertos uh, y todos tenemos derecho a, a vivir, verdad? Pero... And those people are um, being found dead and everyone has a right to life. No importa cómo lo vistamos, pero no 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 El gobierno ese quizás no entiende que... We should all have the right to dress the way we want to, and perhaps the government doesn't understand that. Él está matando a todos los gays, y entonces eso... Él dice que, que está matando a los pandilleros, que los está... He's killing gay people. He says he's killing gang members. Pero eso es pura mentira. But that's a lie. Él lo que está haciendo en las detenciones es dándoles libertad. Para que ellos anden matando a las personas así. So he's just letting people go from the detention center so that they can kill gay people. Now, this is all editorial comment on Rosa Lidia's part. I don't think this is an official opinion, but um, this is what she thinks. También tiene el Bitcoin, ¿verdad? Sí, el Bitcoin es ahorita el Bitcoin está el que él tiene el sello de los tres sellos, ¿verdad? Y entonces. He changed como, their entire economy to Bitcoin. Como so una gente que, como mi mamá, ella es alfabeta, ¿verdad? Ella no puede how meterse is, en el celular. How is my mom, who's illiterate, going to figure out how to use Bitcoin? She doesn't know how to use Bitcoin. Todos los que están ricos con esas monedas son los empresarios. The only people who are making money with that Bitcoin are the rich uh, business people. Uno de pobres se está yendo más abajo porque 
como hay gente en el campo allá en El Salvador que no tiene celular, como Yeah, the people in the countryside, they can't do it. They don't have cell phones to be able to manage that. And that's... So, um, you'll be okay, so um, this is turning into a really long answer, but um, also, like, my daughter who made it to her third year of high school um, before she got kidnapped, um, the government's not trying to find those people jobs. And so there's no jobs. Even if you get all the way through high school, you can't get a job. And why isn't the government working on that? Okay, thank you so much for those uh, answers, Rosa, Linda, and Jennifer, for your translation. Um, I see that we're getting close to the top of the hour, and I'm wondering if Cecilia and um, Jennifer and Jen, that you might have some closing words that you'd like to offer to us uh, before I actually close us out. So just take a minute and um, Cecilia, I noticed that you did put in, and I've actually clicked through uh, to see the Facebook page, and I will definitely um, keep track of that. But are there any closing words uh, that you'd like to offer to us before our, our time ends today? You need to unmute. Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you. I'd, I'd like to put uh, the link to the Padlet, which I showed before, because it's full of material which I uh, hadn't the opportunity to show because, because of the time. And my, my final, uh, uh, let's say, um, awareness after this meeting with you is that all over the world there are um, there, a, a movement, a transnational movement demanding a different system. And of, although we don't, do not really know how it can work, but we know that this system doesn't work. It's mm -hmm. incompatible with human dignity. And we have to start from this negative paradigm. This is not what I want, not in my name. And we have to, um, to keep an eye to what this, this paradigm is uh, causing in terms of death and suffering. And where we see that this paradigm, that, that the, the capitalism is really producing evidence of how inhuman it is, we have to shout it loud and all together. Thank you so much for those words, Cecilia. Jennifer, do you, and uh, Rosalinda, do you have some closing words that you'd like to offer to us? Sure. I'm, I'm um, you know, very grateful to be able to do this work. I would wish that there was a whole system for receiving people at our southern border. We desperately need something like that. But I also do believe that what we really need is an international um, solution. And I heard, I think that our are, are the climate, um, the, the international climate meetings. And I understood that at the current meeting that's going on, the subject of refugees is not going to be discussed, but I think that it has to be because that's our best body that we have right now for looking at the problems of the world. We're not doing a very good job on climate, but, but the, the issue of displacement is strongly related to climate. And I think, I think that's where we're gonna have to go to, to come up with some better solutions because Italy can't do it all. Texas can't do it all either. We need to, we need to be thinking about this globally. Rosalía, ¿tú quieres decir algo para finalizar? Sí, yo les agradezco mucho y, y gracias por por haberme escuchado y también por yo ver esto de lo que puso allí, verdad? No sé cómo se llama la muchacha de lente. Yeah, so um, thank you very much and thank you for listening to me and thank you for the things that you posted, uh, Cecilia. Mm -hmm. Sí, o sea que todos somos 
humanos, ¿verdad? Y como le dije, todos tenemos derecho a vivir. So we're all humans and we all have the right to life. Les agradezco mucho y que Dios me los bendiga. And I really appreciate you and may God bless you. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Rosa Linda, for your closing words. And you, Jen, is there something that you'd like to offer to us before we close? Well, I, I want to thank you all so much for, for your uh, wonderful explanations of the ways things are and that make it clear to people to be, a, to be able to understand and, and know what's going on. And I just am thinking, you know, the trillions of dollars that the, the people like, I don't know, the corporate heads and the Bezos and uh, Gates and everyone are making on, on, the, on the medicine that they're not allowing people in the global south to, to, uh, to have. And, that, see, they don't have it. They can't do anything free. It has to all be paid for and paid for and repaid for. And it goes funnels up into the top of the billionaires that already have that money. And that it would be so much better and so useful that money would be in, in, uh, in the countries that are being exploited to, to take the money away. So, um, I think it would be, it, it's just so important to be able to see these, these uh, imbalances, the, the, which are just like the environmental imbalances. Everything is totally uh, wrong, giving to a few where, and taking from the very many. So uh, we can do differently though, we can. And I think humanity will, uh, do things differently and we will make it. Thank you so much, Jen. Rosa, um, Rosa Lydia sent me a hug. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm gonna just give you a few little uh, housekeeping things for yourself. You can always write to the maternal gift economy uh, movement at gmail.com and we will send you this chat so that you can read these comments because there are some very, very wonderful comments here in the chat and all the links will be there. Also a Padlet, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, that is a, um, an application that you can click into and all of those links that you saw on the screen during Cecilia's talk will be there and available for you so that you can make comments and you can also watch all those videos, all right? Um, that's one thing. I wanted to just really thank Jennifer Long um, and Rosa, Lydia, Cecilia, and Genevieve for all of your really um, truth-telling words today. They were Sometimes the images were challenging because it just is so heart-wrenching, but we must see what is in order for us to vision the next place that we need to be. And um, I wanna recommend, if you were unable to be with us, uh, Kathy Jones was with us not too long ago and you can check on our website, but she has a wonderful vision called A Mother World that you can learn about in her salon. So I wanna refer you to that as a place to begin to visioning a different type of world that we can live in. I wanna thank Diane and Elena for your technical support and behind the scenes, Liliana and Judith for your questions and the International Feminists for the Gift Economy for all of your support, your wise words and your tenacity to take down the patriarchy. <laughs> we all need to do this work together. Um, we're gonna to be taking a little longer break and we're going to celebrate because um, November 26th, it's almost three weeks from now, 
we are celebrating an entire year that we've had together in our salons. And we are very thrilled to be able to announce that uh, the women who were with us on uh, Black Friday, as it's called in, in the United States, also globally, it's called Buy Nothing Day. We will have the same fabulous women, Darcia Navarez, Genevieve Vaughn, Heidi Gutner Abendroth, Mary Condren, Sherry Mitchell, and Vandana Shiva. So we'll have a global perspective about the maternal gift economy. So we hope that you will join us. Also, today's video recording is going to be posted on our website along with all of the other references that we possibly can um, so that you can, at your personal level, have a global effect. That's maternal gift economy movement. Org. If you'd like to be notified of our upcoming salons and events, you can sign up there. We welcome your questions and your comments, especially if you have any suggestions for Rosalinda of how she might be able to get her daughter here. Um, please send them to us at maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. We'll see you in three weeks on November 26th. For those of us in the USA, have a very happy Thanksgiving. And remember, buy nothing. Use the gift economy. Be well, stay safe, be kind to one another. Everyone, take good care. Thank you, Letitia. And thank you, everybody. Bye for now. Bye. Thank you.